Bonjour à vous, toute l'équipe d'Hypothèse est ravie d'inaugurer cette nouvelle saison des conférences qui marque la dixième année d'existence de cette initiative. Nous tenions à remercier chacune des personnes qui a accepté de participer à cette adaptation d'Hypothèse, ainsi que le Musée des Beaux-Arts et enfin vous qui nous suivez. Hypothèse est une série de conférences bilingues organisées par et pour les étudiants et étudiantes en histoire de l'art dans le but de diffuser la recherche émergente dans la discipline. Vu la situation actuelle, les conférences pour la session d'automne vont être filmées au Musée des Beaux-Arts de Montréal et vont être proposées en ligne. Chacune des séances sera suivie une semaine après sa mise en ligne par une rencontre Zoom avec vous pour que vous puissiez échanger avec les intervenants et intervenantes. Nous vous invitons donc à nous suivre sur nos réseaux sociaux afin que vous puissiez vous tenir informés. Each session provides an opportunity for two panelists to present for approximately 20 minutes each, followed by questions and discussion moderated by a session chair. With that, we leave you with our first session, entitled Archéologie des médias, Redefining Object Agencies, featuring presentations by Aurélie Petit, Emilie Banvi, and moderated by session chair Emmanuel chateau dutier Pour notre première intervention, j'ai le plaisir d'introduire Aurélie Petit, qui est doctorante au département de Film Studies de l'Université Concordia et qui va nous parler de ses investigations en archéologie des médias avec l'Eastman Kodak Instant Camera. Please let me introduce Aurélie Petit. She's a PhD student in the Film Studies department of Concordia University. Her current research focuses on the discourses of, on Japanese animation imagery on online platforms since the early 90s. Um, with an emphasis on political and masculinities, but today she will talk to us about our media archaeology investigation with the Eastman Kodak Instant Camera in a lecture entitled Undead Photography, a Media Archaeological Approach to the Handel Kodak Camera. Okay, so first of all, uh, hello everyone, and I wish to thank the organizers of the Hypothèse Conference for allowing me to present today and for working their way through a global pandemic. I also want to say that I'm not an art history student, so I probably won't be, you know, won't use well-known rhetoric that most of you are used to, to use or be as eloquent as the other presenter today. But I still wish that my presentation will contribute meaningfully to ongoing conversation uh, on relationship between art, object and capitalism, which are nevertheless subject close to my heart. So all that being said, today I would be presenting on one object in particular, so the Kodak Endol camera. So by 1976, uh, the Eastman Kodak company introduced to the market of instant photography, until then notoriously monopolized by Polaroid Corporation, its own camera of the Ica and the Kodomatic series. The result of it was a 15 year trial between Polaroid and Kodak for copyright infringement, which has been massively reported in the press at the time and is still considered as of today as one of the biggest legal battles in American media history. Polaroid was accusing Kodak of 12 patent infringements and of having made its own business lost nearly $4 billion. After being forced to remove any instant camera from shelves in 1985 and to pay $900 million to Polaroid, Kodak stopped producing instant camera. Kodak's future in instant photography was rightfully, extre was rightfully extremely compromised as not only cameras were taken out of the market in the States, but also their film, which is going to be a very important point for this presentation. And with that film to function, Kodak Instant Camera became almost nothing but a heavy, cheap, plastic-based camera obscura. But before its abrupt ending, the camera was advertised as an accessible mean of photography for all gender and race, and all that at a low price. <laughs> and this 1977 ad that I found is showing. So be careful, you're going to have this song stuck in your, mind, in your head for months. Kodak's got the instant camera you've been waiting for. Instant color photographs, that's what the handle's for. So carry on. Carry on. Let yourself go. Let yourself go. Grab onto the handle at a low, low price for dry, self-timing color pictures that happen in minutes, right before your eyes. Grab onto the handle and carry on. Carry on. The handle. Kodak's newest and lowest priced instant camera. Okay, so this ad that we just saw and the discourse it is building about the Kodak audience is worth noting, as the manual provided with the camera that is shown here 
actually isn't insisting as much on this multicultural audience, but rather on a very traditional white nuclear family. And what springs from this manual is the idea of the endor camera, as what Jill Pasternak described in his article, taking snapshot, leaving the picture, the Kodak company making of, biography, of photographic biography as an apparatus for uh, pictorial biographies. So therefore, photography has a mean to capture everyday life and to preserve family moments on film throughout the years. So despite their differences, both paratextual materials, so the advertisement and the manual, are advertising the easiness of the instant camera technology. So for example, here we see like children and it's full of tips for being a better photograph. So suddenly the instant camera technology is accessible to anyone. And so whether this anyone refer to your race, your gender, or your little sibling. And such discourse was also a big part of the Polaroid company marketing strategy at the time, such as shown in this other ad that we're gonna see, that is also about you know, the easiness of the camera. Here comes Marcel Marceau with his dog. Marcel loves to take a picture of his dog with the world's simplest camera. And to show it proudly to his friends. Marcel also loves to take a picture of his friends with the world's simplest camera, the new Polaroid 1000. There's nothing to focus. Marcel just presses the button, the motor hands him the picture, and he watches it develop in vivid SX-70 color. Marcel finally agrees. Real pictures are nicer than pretend ones. Only 24 pounds, the world's simplest camera, Polaroid 1000. But so, 40 years later, in 2020, the discourse on instant photography has changed, as photography has become increasingly accessible, both as a technology through our phones, like smartphones, but also as an easy shared media with immediate access to platforms such as social media. A very popular and simple example is Instagram, which as of April 2020 had 1 billion monthly active users. Of course, a lot has been said about the myth of equal accessibility to technologies and internet across class, race, gender, and locality. But I think we can safely assume that for most people nowadays, photography has become an easier than ever media practice. And whether this practice is done from an amateur point of view or professional. And similarly, the advertisement of instant photography and instant camera has evolved. It isn't much about easiness or, or accessibility as a not unique cell point anymore but rather about the materiality of the photographic experience. So we're going to like, watch one final ad, which is this 2020 commercial untitled Real Connection from the Polaroid, uh, for the Polaroid Now, which is Polaroid new instant camera. And I believe it's actually a very great example of the new discourse on instant photography. So this is exactly what happened when you take a picture with it. So posted on Polaroid official YouTube channel in March, the description of so this ad read, we exist to help you see those moments, to pause them and to relieve them in something you can hold in your hand and turn to forever. And I think the video is pretty self-explanatory by itself of, you know, it's about now taking pictures of a moment and being able to preserve it as opposite to being on your computer with your partner and listening to music by yourself. So, and there is a similar phenomena that can be observed throughout the recent popularity of disposable camera online and more particularly, more particularly the popularity of one 
uh, video format on TikTok, the video-based social media application. This format of less than one minute video consists of showing your disposable camera, therefore showing your apparatus as, you know, the camera as itself, not only as the apparatus, so to show your disposable camera, not only as the apparatus, but also as part of the aesthetic itself. And zooming into the viewfinder, which then transition into a very fast edit of the photograph taken with your disposable camera. So usually the song You Know It by Colony House is playing in the background, which is a very happy rock song and is described by one YouTube user in the comment section of the video clip as sounding like the perfect high school experience. And TikTok video with this format are gathering hundreds of thousands of likes on the platform, showing their popularity among the application audience, which is mainly teenagers in 2020, who don't need to rely on disposable camera to take a picture. So I would have loved to show it, but you can find it by just going on TikTok and looking for hashtag disposable cameras, like everyone is doing the same thing. So and maybe now you're asking yourself, why am I bringing all of this? And why, for example, uh, TikTok would have anything to do with a Kodak instant camera from the 70s. But I needed to provide you with this background so you can understand that I was in the exact same mindset as those teenager filming their disposable camera when I decided to buy the Kodak handle camera at a church sale two years ago. Not only I was totally unaware of the past history of Kodak and instant photography, but I was mainly motivated by the idea of taking snapshots with a cool vintage camera, and then of course to report about it on social media. So following my first encounter with the Kodak EK2 handle bought uh, as a, 15 years, a $15 bundle, so back camera plus film at a Memorial church sale uh, two years ago, which, you know, retrospectively could be considered a scam because of how useless the object could turn out to be without certain material and certain knowledge, I tried to take a picture as the camera so came with loaded film and the inst original instruction manual. After two failed attempts resulting in deep un uh, underexploited purple photograph, definitely convincing me that the battery was dead, I, it needed to be changed. I put the, uh, the camera and its black leather bag aside and, you know, I self pursued myself that I would eventually go back to it. So two years later and three moving after, in March 2020, my quest to make it work finally began. So I, make it, I decided to go into this project because uh, last semester I took a class on media archaeology at Concordia. And so for me, when I finally understood what media archaeology was, I was like, OK, I'm going to do this. So I decided in a description of media archaeology in the context of discard studies and quoting Sarah Moore, Suzanne Pratt, which so is on the PowerPoint, explains that media archaeology share a close affinity with work exploring the notion of waste as archive, in which waste become a means to highlight alternative disenfranchised histories of current consumer culture. I'm here interested in this notion of waste as archive of a system and a, as a testimony of consumer culture. So I will investigate not only the waste produced by the media itself, but also the discard generated by my own media archaeological practice. So after ordering a new uh, G size V battery on Amazon, I extracted the old one, all black and without any ind indication, but at least 50 years old, as Duracell produces black copper and black color design in 1971. So here, I was then holding my first waste, corroded by alkaline, alkaline leakage and 30 years older than me. As a product of my time, I first turned to YouTube and its parameter community of photography aficionados, certain that someone would have figured out the handle camera before me. Soon, I realized not only very little work has been done on Kodak Instant Camera as a whole, but no one seems to have either succeed or pay attention to the handle. I then I decided to adapt by following a 2016 tutorial video uploaded by user Photo Chemicals, which auto played a little earlier, uh, on the Kodak EK4, another handle camera, uh, instant camera by Kodak, so hoping for a similar result. So which means that by using Fuji Instax mini film and black paper, I could create new film and insert it manually into an empty cartridge in a dark room. So first, it was necessary to have in my possession an empty cartridge of instant film. I took the remaining pictures left in my camera and extracted the cartridge, which 40 years ago would have ended up directly in the trash. Very cool for, for, for soon to be memories, but by itself was purely useless. But in 2020, it had become an essential part of my process. Second, I had to acquire Fuji Intax Mini uh, film. So after taking many buses, I came back home impoverished of $23, but richer of two packs of 10 sheets brought in a Best Buy in the north of Montreal. Third, I had to make a mold for my new film. As the Intax Instax one, you know, as shown here, is uh, 
8.6 cm on 5.4 cm and the regular Kodak film is 10 cm on 10 cm. So, I made different molds with black papers, uh, transparent sheets and tape, and some were entirely black, others were thinner, like other was one side black, one side transparent, and I soon realized the most efficient way was to actually use directly an already taking photograph as it has the perfect consistency and heaviness to be processed by the camera rolls and also the right size. So the felt mold looking like sad art and craft knockoff of instant film were surrounding me, soon to be waste. In, an, in my new and successful mod, I made four incisions in the top corner so I could insert the instant film in an easier process than through tapping. At this point, I become well aware of my own material limitation in the age of COVID. I didn't have an immediate access to a dark room, so I needed to do everything in the darkness of my bathroom, bathroom so to the delight of my roommate, mm -hmm. using only touch and memory. I also needed to figure out how I would manage to extract the film from the Instax cartridge without, possibly, without any possibility to open it, as in, in broad daylight, as any X-ray would instantly ruin the film. So finding pictures or video of an empty Instax mini cartridge turned out to be a hopeless quest. Because why would anyone document trash or risk to, to ruin a new pack just you know, for the pleasure of opening it? This lack of documentation by photography internet expert made me wonder if it was because the camera, so the Instax Mini, happened to be specifically marketed as a child of feminine media with pastel colors and easy to use advertisements and by so not worthy of interest. So I came to accept that my first Instax pack had to be sacrificed in order for me to understand how film could be extracted. While still opening it in the darkness, I would allow myself to touch and force it as much as needed, despite the high possibility of rendering most of the film useless. Again, waste was welcomed by providing knowledge. I also decided to make a homemade portable darkroom box to stock the Insta cartridge between extraction and, and insertion. Oh, yeah, which is here, the dark box. <laughs> Uh, within the camera no guarantee, to guarantee that no unnecessary light would touch the film. I used a carton box that came with my newly acquired toaster, filled it with black paper, closed it with dark tape, and cut a small opening that I could easily close with a little door. My first attempts required adjustments, as much on the technique to extract film as on the technique to insert it within the camera, and then to take the picture. During this three days experiment, I ended up using all of my film, and while not reaching what one would call naturalistic result, the obsolescence of the indoor camera appeared to me more and more as a corporate myth. If the artisanal, expensive and laborious technique I had to put myself through was challenging any discursive aspect of instant photography and even more of Kodak instant camera, advertising multiple commercial, you know, as not only cheap but also practical with this indoor and accessible to all, I was still getting results. Almost 50 years later, this di discard camera was working and it was undead. My own understanding of zombie media melt Wolfgang Ernst's description of it, as quoted by Ernst and Parika in Zombie Media, the article. Uh, so according to Ernst, media archaeology is less about dead media, but media undead. There is an untimeliness of media which is incorporated here. To which they add, zombie media is concerned with media that is not only out of use, but resurrected to new uses, context and adaptation. If I was getting my camera to work and to produce pictures, it was not without analogizing that my personal result both over and underexposed and melted looking, were far from Kodak's initial intention of biographical pictures. In his wide discard study text, Max Loberan justifies this approach by its ability to make economic and social system apparent. Looking at waste is forcing us to look at what is we produced. In the context of the handle camera, I was facing an object, all broken, seemingly deemed to be thrown away, a waste which probably could not be even be processed in a recycling facility now. But then through techniques, this object become usable. And I'm facing a question. What has made the indoor camera a waste in the first place? Going back to the Polaroid against Kodak trial, it appeared evident that waste as a myth and a reality has been created through trials and corporate laws. The indoor became waste when Kodak stopped producing film which are essential for instant photography, while still being a functioning object. It just was not productive anymore within a capitalistic structure. Forty years later, by using Fujifilm to make it function, it is clear photography and its technique exceed legislative restriction. And as Karin Marvin wrote in When All Technologies Were New, media are not fixed natural objects. They have no natural edges. They are constructed complexes of habits, beliefs and procedures 
embedded in elaborate cultural codes of communication. The history of media is never more or less than the history of their uses, which always lead us from them to the social practices and conflicts they illuminate. Similarly to the camera itself, the waste I was producing through my media archaeology execution was far from wasteful, but rather useful for producing knowledge and thinking. Going back to Susan, to Susan uh, Pratt text that I mentioned earlier, <laughs> uh, she states that as a method, media archaeology excavates, excavates digs, rebuilds, combines, acts, remixes, dusts things off, and screw materials and discourse together to generate alternate understanding of present and past media cultures. My methodology led me to waste, produced, appreciated, reused, and archived. All waste means something because of the historical archive it was carrying a battery, an empty cartridge, and a used camera. And the waste newly produced because it, were, it revealed to be much more than just an addition to my bin, therefore pushing me to create meaning out of it. In a contemporary world in which most of our electronic devices have a plan of silence, media archaeology meeting discard studies sounds to my ear like a hopeful love letter to trash and its possibilities for interrogating capitalist system and their failures. Thank you. Pour continuer maintenant, je vais présenter Émilie Bainville, qui est une architecte montréalaise, qui actuellement mène un double doctorat à l'Université de Québec à Montréal et à TU à Eindhoven. Elle est architecte, mais aussi muséologue, et elle va nous présenter un travail sur la curation de l'architecture. Our presentation today is entitled Archive Await New Highs toward an ethnography of archival practice in the creation of architecture. I'd like to start by thanking the team of Hypothèse for inviting me um, to take part in this conference cycle. Uh, so today I'll present my doctoral research, which I started two years ago within UCAM's doctoral program in Museology, Médiation et Patrimoine. And as of uh, last January, I joined the Curatorial Research Collective Uh, and the Chair of Architectural uh, History and Theory at um, the Eindhoven University of Technology in the Netherlands, um, so thereby turning my uh, doctoral project into a collaboration between both universities. This uh, presentation is titled Archives Await New Eyes Toward an, an Ethnography of Archival Practices in the Curation of Architecture, and um, It will discuss the stages of development of my doctoral uh, project, which brings the fields of architecture and museology closer together within um, the shared apparatus of the archive. The project aims to understand how, since the creation of the International Confederation of Architectural Museum in 1979, contemporary, so how contemporary curatorial practices in architecture engage with archives while uh, challenging established modes of historical and theoretical uh, knowledge production. Through comparative uh, ethnographic fieldwork, the project will address the agency of the architecture museum in relation to uh, its archival holdings and is intended to develop an empirical knowledge of innovative methods used uh, for the study and the display of architectural archives. Um, to give an idea of the context in which my uh, research is situated, I will start with a, a recent uh, event. Uh, Paul Rivery Williams was the first architect um, to be licensed in California in 1921, as well as the first um, African-American to become a fellow of the American Institute of Architects in 1957 and to receive the gold medal awarded by that same institute in um, 2017, so posthumously. His uh, personal archives, uh, which comprises drawings, uh, letters, photographs, was thought to have gone up in smoke during the 1992 fire that destroyed the headquarters of Broadway Federal Savings and Loan in the wake of the Rodney King verdict. The architect's business records had been stored um, in there since 1955 after um, the project of transforming the former Woolworths department store into a bank, uh, which was made by Williams himself, was completed. However, um, On June 30th, 2020, the news was announced that the Paul William archives had just been uh, had just been the object of a joint acquisition by the Getty Research Institute in Los Angeles and the University of Southern California School of Architecture, where the architect had graduated in 1919. So the official announcement of this shared custody 
revealed not only that the archival legacy of Williams was not entirely lost to the fire, but that the most important part of it, containing thousands of original drawings, um, had been kept safe in another location under the stewardship of his granddaughter. More than 35,000 architectural plans and 10,000 um, original drawings and additions to blueprints and colored renderings, correspondence and photographs uh, today constitute the Paul Williams archive. Uh, this recent case of a joint acquisition of architectural archives, in addition to a few previous uh, ones, such as the Alvaro Siza archive, which was uh, jointly uh, acquired in 2014 by the CCA in Montreal, the Serralves Foundation in Porto, and the Caluste Gulbekian Foundation in Lisbon. Um, or we can think uh, again of the uh, Frank Lloyd Wright archive, which was acquired in 2012, both by the MoMA and the Avery Architectural and Fine Arts Library at Columbia University in New York. Um, so yeah, those three, uh, those, uh, three cases are prime examples of convergence. The contemporary phenomenon of, of physical um, and digital convergence of institutions such as libraries, archives and museums, commonly designated uh, by the acronym, the, the acronym LAMS or GLAMS, which would include uh, galleries as well. Um, so this contemporary phenomenon questions the meaning making processes through which information is transformed into knowledge whether um, expressed through institutional collaborations enabling collections to be shared, transferred, sliced and diced, or um, through a brick and mortar reunion, convergence within architecture culture has, has impacted interpretive practices related to curatorial, historical, or theoretical research. So I'll come back to this um, phenomenon of convergence a bit later when discussing the methodology, but what is uh, um, what is of significant interest here is to observe how curatorial practices in architecture engage with increasingly converged archival holdings and um, to examine the enhanced potential brought forward by uh, convergence in making archives productive. According to former director of the Canadian Centre for Architecture, Mirko Zardini, I quote, the idea of the archive as a shared field of exploration promises to reinforce a new and different kind of network of institution premised on what institutions do, not only what they have." Unquote. So in the case of architectural archives, uh, the coming together of different academic and professional skills, expertise, um, and best practices turns convergence into an interpretive strategy that goes beyond cooperation and coordination between cultural institutions. So um, keeping uh, this question of convergence in mind as a, as a backdrop for the implementation of my research, I will first present uh, the concepts and theories uh, at the art of my investigation. Secondly, the problem statement will provide an overview of the research questions and objectives. And uh, finally, I will uh, outline the methodological framework and briefly uh, present the selection of case studies. The theoretical framework supporting my research project addresses uh, contemporary archival theory on the one hand and the making of architecture culture through the museum and curation on the other. When uh, architectural historian Mark Wigley affirmed in 2005 that an unused archive is not an archive, an archive is only an archive when it is entered, or more precisely, when things come out. It was concisely evoking, evoking what has uh, recently been referred to as productive, productive archives. Um, that is the idea that archives become meaningful only when they are activated into dynamic entities, enabling new relationships and uh, networks. So in a further uh, exploration of the meaning of this notion of productive archive, my doctoral uh, project addresses three core concept concepts, the archive, architecture, or architecture culture, and the museum. Within my uh, research, the archive is understood as an epistemological concept and subject of study, transcending its existence as an object. In addition, architecture is considered in its intellectual and disciplinary dimension rather than solely in its uh, constructive or built form. 
And finally, the museum is conceptualized as an apparatus for knowledge production, an alternative meaning making, and as a laboratory for research, in addition, uh, of course, to its interpretive roles uh, and functions of transmission. The first core concept uh, around which this research project is structured is, uh, like I mentioned, the productive archive. So before explaining the, the notion, um, I must specify what is meant here by the archive in the singular um, and not the archives in the plural. Um, so in the context of this research, it is not the archive as a document, as a physical entity, um, that is at stake, but the archive as a concept, as epistemological entity, so the archive as subject instead of archives as sources. Um, in a broader perspective, what has been referred to as uh, the archival term since the 90, uh, 90s um, has shifted discourses from product to process, as well as the ideas of archives as repositories documenting history to active and human constructed object, objects shaping reality. So this changing uh, conception of the archive associated with um, postmodern thinking has transformed the archive's processes of creation, interpretation and transmission, as well uh, as its reception as a culture, cultural uh, artifact. In the archive is a productive space of conflict published by Sternberg Press in 2016. Architect and curator Tina Di Carlo refused the idea of the archive as being inert and retrospective, autonomous and representational. She claims that the architectural object, traditionally collected uh, as plans, section models, elevation, has to be reconceptualized. Rather than a repository or amorphous mass of inert objects inscribed in an unbroken linear linearity, the archive is living and productive a practice in which things are agent in architecture, be it theory, criticism, history, or practice, is produced through the discursive dissemblance of things over time. As such, the productive archive is an archive that produces something new and unprecedented. So productive is here understood as proactive in the sense that the archive is no longer a static form, but a dynamic practice. As argued by architect and writer Marcus Meeson, uh, the conflictual archive, or the archive considered as a space of, as a productive space of conflict, conflict here being employed in the sense of means of production. Um, so the conflictual archive, according to Marcus Meeson, refers to productive encounters that allow Atlant exploration and discussion of issues related to archival practices. So such, such an endeavor is motivated by the desire to move away from the, the conception, um, the traditional reading of the archive as a, space, as a space of storage toward an understanding of the relationship between storage and production. That is what is made of an archive when, once it exists uh, or what prompts its transition from fixity to activity. Uh, so from being um, passive, static, closed to being active, dynamic, open and eventually, in the third stance, um, productive. Therefore, the notion of the productive archive is closely associated with the use and the practices of archives. Many archival theorists have explored this uh, um, transition of the archive from passivity to activity and defined the activated archive in many ways, such as um, dynamic archive, living or fluid archive, or again, an archive or counter archive. Uh, I personally have retained the notion of dynamism, not as being synonymous with the productive archive, but as a condition to productivity. Here is an example of, the, of an alternative way of organizing knowledge called the dynamic order. This principle was institute, uh, instituted at the Sitterweck Library and Archive in St. Gallen in Switzerland, and um, I thought it was relevant for rethinking the, the, the use of archives. The, so the dynamic order entails a different type of knowledge organization, which is based on use. Uh, and in this case, it's applied to a library and a material archive. Uh, and so um, an organization that uh, does not rely on the idea of fixity in space and in time, but that allows for a never changing arrangement tracked by a continuous inventory. So the principle of the dynamic order first translates into innovative spatial representations of the collection holdings. Uh, 
in addition to the, the typical search result list, uh, the Sitterweg digital catalog will produce an elevation view of the book's location on the shelves and of the materials, locations, and the drawers, as um, you can see here on the screen, providing a direct visualization of how the contents are distributed in space. Therefore, since the order constantly uh, changes as a result of use, it is the relationships between the books continuously created and recreated that become uh, the system rather than the predetermined permanent classification based on the book's individual ID numbers. So through this um, associative system, conceptual bridges made by different users between books and objects are mapped and are archived in order to make them potentially productive for um, subsequent users. So the use defines the system, the use here is the system. The Sitterweg's dynamic order as a process and a system breaks open conventional structures and hierarchies of order and stimulates serendipity. It is a creative approach um, to mitigate the disconnection between the haptic and the virtual, that is between the stored and organized material on one hand and its abstract digital representational system on the other. Um, and this case uh, illustrates how dynamism, without being synonymous with productivity, can nonetheless enable a productive use of archives. The anat anatomy of the archive, in the sense of its uh, internal structure, must also be explored in question. Like a non-structure, like we have here, can be immensely, uh, immensely productive and even sometimes become conditional to productivity. Just like, uh, di just like the dynamic order relies on ephemerality and never becomes permanent, the productive archive never becomes a product and always remain remains an open-ended process. Uh, it's, it is constantly growing as an accumulation of clusters of knowledge generated around existing materials and brought together through new connections. Um, so more than a passive archive rendered active, the productive archive entails a transition from uh, a regime of representation or re reproduction to one of inception, conception or simply production. While uh, the conventional archive is concerned with representing finite objects and realities such as facts and evidence, the productive archive is engaged in uncovering the processes having led to such finite products. Shedding light on the underlying stages of the state of becoming of an object or archive and uh, accessing its behind the scenes chronicles, let's say, might indeed be an effective entry point into making its contents meaningful with new or alternative con context. So this uh, crucial uh, dimension of processuality, which largely defines productive archival practices, has been a um, mirror in the curation of architecture for the last few decades, moving from uh, exhibitions based on the representation of completed architectural works to ones fostering production of new original works, be it architectural, curatorial, or both. Uh, as such, the architecture museum is increasingly becoming, um, is increasingly transitioning from keeper to enabler of knowledge. The research project is articulated around those following questions. One, what is the productive archive? How is it manifest without ar within architecture museums and other examples of converged institutions with architectural orientations? How do curatorial practices allow for a productive use of archives in the curation of architecture? How does the curatorial use of archives and museums and other examples of converged institutions contribute to shaping a scholarly and critical architectural discourse while challenging historical and theoretical knowledge production. So uh, um, extrapolating from these uh, three uh, questions, the research project unfolds along uh, the following hypothesis. The changing conception of the archive associated with postmodern thinking, as I, I referred to uh, previously, has, um, has impacted upon in interpretive practices related to curatorial, historical, and uh, theoretical research, bringing into question the meaning-making uh, processes through which information is transformed into knowledge within architecture culture, where um, the archive on display 
um, that is the archive simply exhibited as a museum object is no longer a um, prevalent paradigm. So from the way historical and theoretical research is performed in archival collections to the way its findings and outcome are displayed, the archival turn has been reorienting the curation of architecture from a platform of knowledge representation, as I mentioned before, to one of knowledge production, um, thus opening up a discursive and critical space encompassing the practical and theoretical dimensions of the discipline. The methodological framework developed in the context of this uh, research project will combine um, a classical literature review of primary and secondary sources with ethnographic fieldwork. So the research, um, the research project is based on a comparative approach premised upon the research and analysis of three case study institutions. The selection of cases was made following certain criteria intended to address the limited but coherent uh, sample of architectural institutions that actively work with their uh, archival collection. So each case had to correspond to either to a museum, a library, or an archive, and had to express a certain um, form and degree of convergence. In addition, each case had to be a current member, member of the International Confederation of Archi Archi Architectural Museums, sorry, or the ICAM, um, which is a subcommittee of the ICOM. Additionally, the selection of uh, case studies was made in accordance with uh, pre-established typologies of institutional convergence. Intra-institutional convergence, inter-institutional and cross-institutional. The research project will seek to depict how archival, curatorial and interpretive practices uh, respectively observed within the collecting institution represented by the three case studies productively activate their archival collections. So by, by observing their practices, the project will also aim to evaluate how convergence impacts upon the respective missions, ideologies, um, and to a certain extent, uh, their knowledge production. So the first case study um, associated with the intra-institutional type of convergence is the Canadian Centre for Architecture in Montreal. Uh, it was created in 1979 um, as an international research institution and museum premised on the belief that architecture is a public concern. It's, uh, this case is illustrative of uh, in-house convergence um, in a sense that everything that is preserved and produced at the CCA is perceived as one single collection made uh, of various parts. Conver uh, convergence uh, is primarily thought of as the merging of different types of information here. Also, um, also in a less, uh, less important degree, but uh, as a museum, it's also an, an example of institutional convergence insofar as its um, collection comprises a library and uh, an archive. Um, a specific attention will be given to the out-of-the-box research and exhibition, exhibition series as a demonstration of what the notion of the productive archive might mean. Um, it, first, it was first envisioned, uh, envisioned in 2003 by um, former, curator, uh, former director Mirko Zardini, which was then a senior consulting curator. Um, and so, yeah, and, and, and out of the box is an experimental format for exploring newly, or newly acquired, not yet processed archival material entering the vaults of the institution. Submitting the archive to um, critical eyes from outside the institution and also from various disciplinary backgrounds uh, was a keystone of such a curatorial attempt at broadening the edges and purpose of the collection. The second case study uh, associated with the inter-institutional type of convergence is the Vlaams Architecture Institute or the Flanders Architecture Institute based in Antwerp in Belgium. Um, it was publicly founded um, in 2001 to stimulate the public debate uh, on the design of buildings and cities and to disseminate knowledge about architecture, culture through exhibition, publication, lectures, um, events, etc. Since its merger with the architectural archives of the province of Antwerp uh, recently in January 2018, an uh, increase in collection-based exhibition has been observed. 
focusing on research projects such as unfolding the archive, persistent architecture, and towards a blueprint for an architecture collection in Flanders. This case study um, will allow to further examine uh, how interinstitutional convergence, whether it is physical or virtual or both, lead uh, to the productive use of archive. Uh, and the third uh, case study is associated with uh, the cross-institutional typology of convergence. Um, and it uh, represents um, a conceptually dispersed or fragmented archive, uh, which was jointly um, acquired and managed by two or more institutions. In this case, it's the, it's the, it's the Frank Lord Wright Archive, um, whose custody, as I mentioned uh, earlier in the introduction, is shared between um, the MoMA and the Avery Architectural and Fine Arts Library in New York. Uh, this, case, yeah, this case is particularly interesting because uh, it involves a very close collaboration between two types of knowledge institu institutions, um, the museum and the library. So the study will be conducted through the lens of the widely referenced framework of uh, actor theory, of the act actor network theory, sorry, in social sciences. Um, in order to reconceptualize the relationships between, on the one hand, the material, uh, so the archives contained in, in the architectural collections, and the social, um, made of actors such as historians, researchers, archivists, curators. So through the actor network theory, archival and curatorial work uh, are conceived as socially and culturally situated practice, uh, situated practice as in con context specific, or um, more precisely as a subtype of social knowledge making practice. The use of this approach is also, um, I thought it was also appointed uh, in order to demonstrate how the convergence uh, conceptually impacts the relationship between what is collected, what is researched and what is exhibited, um, and thereby points toward what scholar Elena Robinson has termed a greater interpretive sustainability. To conclude, if the architecture museum as it exists now is not enough, then archiving architecture for historical documentation and preservation alone is also not enough. In the museum is not enough. A manifesto-like booklet, uh, which was published um, by Sternberg Press at the end of 2019, the Canadian Centre uh, for Architecture indeed engages in a crucial reconsideration of its curatorial activity in the light of current social concerns. Um, likewise, my research project proposes to renew the approaches to studying architecture culture as this culture is shaped inside the walls of museum and archiv archival institutions. Um, while many scholarly initiatives have recently addressed the development of the historiographical knowledge of architecture exhibitions, uh, per se, there is uh, a gap to fill in the understanding of the specific relation between archives, museums, and curatorial practices. There's also a significant gap between theory and practice in the field of architecture culture, for which the archive appears to be one of the potential sites to help cross uh, the divide. There's also a need for further scholarship addressing the use of architectural archives for, for knowledge production and future historiographies. Um, and by combining the disciplines of museology, architecture, and library and information science, uh, the thesis itself expresses the relevance of uh, multidisciplinary approaches to the study of architecture, culture, and humanities in general. So eventually, the outcomes of this research aim to address two broader issues. First, um, though there are a few architecture schools in Europe and in the United States uh, that are offering um, training profiles in curatorial practices, the, po the potential to teach and learn through direct engagement with uh, archival collections um, seems undervalued today, and the need to demonstrate uh, their pedagogical re relevance. Second, by addressing issues and debates associated with the increasing convergence of cultural institutions in the 21st century. Uh, the project will contribute to the growing empirical scholarship devoted to this phenomenon, particularly uh, in architecture. Thank you. Alors merci beaucoup pour ces deux conférences qui étaient vraiment passionnantes euh, et je crois qu'en certains points elles, elles se font écho. 
Peut-être que pour commencer, j'aurais des questions à, à vous poser, Aurélie. Euh, à un moment, vous, vous, vous parliez d'adopter en fait, euh, euh, le même état d'esprit euh, que l'expérience qui était proposée euh, à l'époque euh, avec cette machine. Euh, finalement, l'expérience que vous expérimentez, elle est extrêmement différente que celle qui était euh, proposée initialement, non Oui, euh, c'est un peu ce que je dis d'ailleurs dans, dans la présentation, que plutôt que je n'essaye pas de m'en rapprocher, mais plutôt de challenger un peu ce... Donc l'expérience euh, qui était, comment dire, maybe if I do it in English, it's going to be better. Of course, yes. So for example, what was advertised in the ad, it was the easiness, and me by my presentation, I'm trying to challenge it. And by saying I'm totally like taking the experience out and making it art in a sense, even if I, I have no pretension that saying the reduce I've produced are art, you know, but I think they're mostly failures, but there is beauty in failures. So... I think I, what I wanted to say more is that I feel like I, I look more like those teenagers on TikTok who try to have like a cool vintage camera than me like trying to do the 1970s experience. Mais l'expérience qui était proposée à l'époque, c'était une expérience d'instantanéité. Là, clairement, il y a beaucoup plus de, de, la, de labeur pour obtenir une image. C'est évident. C'était une expérience qui, qui était sociale aussi, avec, comme vous le montrez avec les photographies. Et ce qui est étonnant aussi, c'est qu'aujourd'hui, on essaye de retrouver cette expérience dans des, des dispositifs plus contemporains. Alors, vous avez montré une publicité pour le Polaroid, donc il y a un reenactment du Polaroid, mais... Il y a aussi des, des technologies euh, qui permettent, euh, par exemple, de contourner le numérique pour produire un, un objet matériel. Euh, je pense à Kodak qui a essayé de faire des appareils photo qui impriment directement euh, l'image. Est-ce que pour vous, c'est la même expérience que euh, ce que proposait euh, l'Instant Kodak euh, like, quel genre de caméra Quand on passe par le numérique et qu'on a une imprimante euh, intégrée, ah. par exemple. Je pense qu'il peut ressembler à I think, but for me, it's for example, Kodak trying to make like cameras that prints right now. It's more the idea of, you know, instead of going toward a certain direction, which would be like, oh, we don't use paper anymore. It's like, oh no, we go back to paper. So I think it's different just in sense of temporality and of goals. It's like Kodak instant camera, it was the only way. It's like, you want your picture because it's the only way you can get your picture. When right now Kodak is kind of saying like, oh, You know, you could get digitally, but you can also get your picture. So I think it's just that it's, it's offering a new discourse on photography and on, on the materiality of the, of the photography experience. But is there a, like an added value to this uh, material artifact? Because like we said, we, we, can, we can produce the exact same result digitally with our yeah. phones, with our smart, smartphones and TikToks and all of this. So I guess it's like this cult around Uh, or this aura around the, the material artifact that is increasingly disappearing from our lives. Yeah, uh, exactly. It's like the capital of vintage. The capital of vintage. Like, it mm -hmm. just, for example, it's me buying for $15 a camera in a church sale. When yeah. I, I had no idea if it could work. Mm -hmm. And I really, I, which is why like, I put myself also in this equation of like, I also feed into this system. But does it have to work? Uh, to some yeah. extent? I, I don't know, it's a good question. <laughs> Because I didn't know if it was going to work, I just bought it. <laughs> Which <laughs> Because it was only $15. I think if it was more, I would have. Mais l'investigation, du coup, elle est venue après coup, parce que du coup, il y a eu le cours euh, mm -hmm. sur l'archéologie des médias, et là, vous vous êtes dit, bah, je vais réactiver cet objet-là. Yeah. Ou vous aviez déjà l'intention de le faire avant I, I wanted to, and then <laughs> life happened. It just, I buy it, it doesn't work right away. And because I'm used to the immediate, immediate of the photographic experience, I'm like, oh, it doesn't work. Well, I'm just going to put it aside and I would eventually go back to it. I was, I was thinking oh, I can just find the tutorial on YouTube. But then when I actually started to try to make it work, I saw that like it was going to be really not easy because in my mind, I, was, I thought that I just needed to buy, need to buy new film and to change the battery. But then, you know, film got discontinued and I tried to, send to, to change the battery and it, it was really the smallest obstacle. <laughs> it's funny because if, if, I, if I may, it, it reminds me of your title, your presentation title, Undead, mm -hmm. 
and, and, and the paradox is that you had to go on the digital, on, on the virtual, on YouTube yeah. to find how to, how to proceed with an object, with a, an, a vintage object that is no longer in, in common use anymore. Yeah. And so it's also about lear unlearning. It's like if we, yeah, we, we, we unlearn how to, how to deal with those material artifacts. And yeah. Yeah, it's like the idea, it's like the idea of black box. It's like, for example, you know, the console Wii, you don't have a support tech, uh, technical support for it anymore. It doesn't mean it doesn't work. It just means that Nintendo say, if you break it, we're not going to fix it for you. But, the, you know, it's still working. You could still, like, play bowling. Mm. But, and, which is interesting because, just because a corporation decides that an object doesn't work anymore, it doesn't mean, like, exactly, it doesn't mean it's not working. Yeah, no, no, it's obsolescence, yeah. 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 Alors, c'est super intéressant parce que la démonstration que vous faites, elle, elle montre vraiment comment euh, l'archéologie des médias en tant que méthode permet de révéler euh, d'autres euh, phénomènes à l'œuvre, euh, des enjeux sociaux, et ici par exemple autour de l'obsolescence technique. Euh, C'est bon, très intéressant parce que finalement, d'une certaine manière, Polaroid avait euh, un, un concept qui lui permettait de vendre des consommables, et des consommables qui sont directement dépendants de son appareil, euh, ce qui fait concurrence à Kodak, parce que Kodak du coup euh, euh, ne vend plus ses, ses films, même s'il les fabrique pour Polaroid à un moment. Euh, et quand, euh, Pola, quand Kodak copie euh, Polaroid avec ce, ce type de machine, euh, en fait, euh, la question que je me pose, c'est pourquoi Kodak a perdu son procès euh, Finalement, c'était quoi qui était breveté, breveté euh, et qui génère ce, cette obsolescence euh, D'une certaine façon, euh, euh, on a l'impression que ce qui était breveté, c'était... Euh, c'était l'expérience euh, qui était proposée. Alors j'ai lu qu'il y avait 7 brevets sur 12 euh, sur lesquels euh, Polaroid revendiquait, sur lesquels ils ont eu le gain de cause, mais je, je ne connais pas les détails. Euh, et finalement, euh, c'est le procédé chimique qui a fait perdre Kodak ou c'est vraiment euh, la reproduction de l'expérience qu'offrait euh, no, Polaroid Je pense que c'est vraiment ça. Oui, c'est l'expérience et le discours, en fin de compte. C'est probablement sur un trial, il est allé et probablement les chimiques like, étaient très hauts. In the stakes, but it's probably just they went against the experience. They said, like, no, we are doing the, you know, instant camera experience, and by stealing this and advertising in this sense, you're doing the same thing as us. So this is like unfair. So I, I imagine they would be. I would need to. I read a lot of articles, but a few months ago, when I was doing the class. So, but it's because it has been so massively reported. It's actually very easy to find like a lot of so a lot of report of the trial in media mais euh, à un moment vous disiez euh, que d'une certaine manière euh, en fait l'appareil fonctionnait encore comme une chambre claire euh, est-ce que c'est encore le cas pour des appareils numériques aujourd'hui on pourrait euh, on serait confronté au même type de, de, de rapport avec ces appareils maybe i think it was easy to go on the Kodak instant camera because it's a very uh, kind of it's not a very scary camera It's like I can actually open it and look inside. But with digital camera, it's like, is there kind of this idea of like, this, this, there is this full expertise that is needed on it? You know, it's like the Wii, for example. I don't know if it's uh, such a good example because it's still a complicated like, object. But I don't know, it, it would be worse to do it. Il y a des communautés de hackers qui font yeah, la exactly. modification d'appareils mm -hmm. électroniques yeah. qui les reprogramment. Mm -hmm. Euh, donc effectivement, peut-être. Peut Alors une chose qui moi me, me frappe un peu avec l'archéologie des médias, c'est que souvent, euh, enfin l'utilisation du terme archéologie, elle est quasiment métaphorique chez euh, Jussi Parika ou les, les différents auteurs, et si, ça a quand même tendance à, à toujours amener la, la question du côté du paradigme ex excavateur de l'archéologie. C'est-à-dire en gros, ce qui définit l'archéologie, c'est de faire des trous, et donc euh, faire des trous, ça permet de découvrir des déchets, euh, et donc c'est un, un peu cette voie-là que, que vous activiez. Euh, en même temps, euh, ça, moi je pensais à, au travail de deux archéologues, je ne sais pas si vous les connaissez, de Paris 4, qui eux ont proposé une archéologie moderne et contemporaine, une archéologie générale, et qui disaient mais finalement l'archéologie ne peut pas être réduite à la fouille, euh, il faut euh, précisément euh, euh, refonder l'archéologie du point de vue euh, de ce à quoi elle permet d'accéder en termes de connaissances, euh, autrement pour euh, ne pas limiter euh, du coup l'archéologie aux périodes anciennes, donc ça rejoint un petit peu l'archéologie des médias, 
euh, mais aussi euh, essayer d'avoir une théorie de l'homme qui fabrique, en quelque sorte. Euh, et ici, j'ai l'impression que l'archéologie des, des médias, quand elle s'intéresse aux objets, euh, elle, elle prend l'objet comme, euh, comme sujet euh, de, de recherche, euh, plutôt que l'activité fabricante euh, de l'homme. Est-ce que vous êtes d'accord avec ce, cette lecture-là de la discipline Donc, uh, so more media archaeology is looking at the object rather than the practice mm. or the uses. I don't know. What, what would you thought about it? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I think what, what Emmanuel means, um, um, yeah, that it, 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 it focuses on the object, whereas um, media archaeology, the media is not, uh, is not um, firstly, firstly an object, it's, it's, it's a practice. Yep. So, um, je caricature un peu parce qu'en pratique, je sais que dans l'archéologie des médias, on s'intéresse aux usages et à, au reenactment aussi, à d'autres dimensions. Mais en fait, finalement, c'est à travers le, une focalisation sur l'objet directement. Et ça, je trouve ça très intéressant. En même temps, par exemple, vous nous avez très peu parlé des artefacts que vous avez produits ou de, de ce que vous appreniez en fait, de la photographie à ce moment-là, mais plutôt des dimensions sociales. Uh, yeah, it was really more about the methodology, rather than like, and which is kind of, when I started to work in media archaeology, my first idea was to do the Minitel, because it's interesting, and in North America it's actually not very studied, but I kept on being, not kind of like going back to the object, but to the uses, and I was like, oh, but I can find so many archives of the uses of the Minitel, but then my professor kept on saying, but you would need to actually use the Minitel, which is very difficult, because in Canada you cannot really find one, And you need to to make work because it's based on communication, and so I kept on like being challenged because I was like, but no, but if I look at the uses, but it was not media archaeology. It was going to be a kind of media archaeology that was very difficult to do. So that's why in the end I was like, I have a camera, <laughs> which is so easy. So let's start from the object. Yeah, exactly. Of starting from starting from the practice. Yeah. Alors, ce qui est très frappant, euh, ce que vous me faisiez remarquer tout à l'heure, Émilie, c'est que en fait, la focalisation sur le déchet qui est présente dans l'archéologie des médias, elle renvoie euh, directement aux, aux archives. Pourquoi est-ce que vous faites ce parallèle euh, Oui, mais en fait, ce qui me frappe le plus, c'est que quand vous mentionnez à un moment que le déchet dans votre expérience, In your in your experience, waste was welcome mm -hmm. because it was providing knowledge, and, and it was really uh, close to, to, to what I'm um, to what I'm saying in my uh, um, in relation to, to archives that uh, to let's say dead or dead or passive archives that are, are stored and, and that uh, remain stored, um, and at some at some point that they are equivalent equivalent to to but the, yeah to a waste. And, and when the researcher or the actor, um, uh, whatever, whichever it might be, the historian, the curator, the archivist, uh, activates, activates it and, and, and perhaps makes it productive, um, yeah, to me it was really, it was like we were speaking of the same thing at some point. Mais du coup, il y a, a l'idée de ranimer les morts, mais les archives, euh, la même idée, mais en fait, quand... quand en fait, ce qui est, ce qui est frappant, euh, d'une certaine manière, alors pour animer les morts peut-être, mais les, quand, quand les, les, la Confédération internationale des, des musées d'architecture oui. se crée, oui. euh, c'est très très contemporain euh, de tout un mouvement euh, en, en architecture qu'on a appelé le postmodernisme, mm -hmm. euh, notamment 79, l'année de fondation de la Confédération. C'est Confédération Oui. Confédération, ouais. oui. Euh, et et l'année de, la, de la Biennale, de la première Biennale oui, d'architecture, oui, ouais, où il y a la Strada Nova, ouais. euh, confiée à Portoghesi. Ouais. Et euh, en fait, c'est un moment où on s'intéresse à l'histoire, ouais. euh, et où l'histoire occupe une place essentielle dans la pratique architecturale. Ouais. Euh, et du coup, je me demandais dans, dans quelle mesure vous étiez allé chercher du côté de ce discours postmoderne, tel qu'il a émergé dans la théorie de l'architecture des années 80, qui permet de théoriser la création de ces, ces archives, mm -hmm. euh, parce que l'histoire a une actualité, euh, et quel lien vous faisiez avec l'actualisation des archives telles qu'elles se présentent aujourd'hui En fait, euh, en fait l'impétus le, le, un peu aussi derrière la, la, la création de la Confédération internationale des musées architecturaux en 1979, c'était euh, 
Ça, ça, ça me sonne un peu également comme un exemple de, de convergence, euh, puisque c'était de mettre euh, en commun et de réunir euh, les, expertises, euh, les expertises en termes de, de, de gestion et d'exploitation des archives architecturales qui, euh, qui étaient peut-être davantage maintenues en, en vase clos. Chaque institution avait, avait son, son modus operandi. Mais clairement, il y avait l'idée... De, de, ben, il fallait créer le musée d'architecture, en fait, ça n'existait pas. Le, en fait, ça fait longtemps. Ben, le musée d'architecture existait, c'était un, 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 un impétus, euh, euh, comme, comme vous disiez, de, de réactiver l'histoire. Puis il y avait tout ce, 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 ce mouvement vers le retour, euh, ouais, un retour aux sources, un retour. Euh, euh, puis une espèce de désillusion aussi qui accompagnait la, 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 la pensée postmoderne, euh, que ce soit en architecture ou, en, ou, ou dans d'autres. Euh, ou dans d'autres euh, domaines, euh, ouais, la, fin, la fin des grands récits et tout. Je ne suis pas capable de vous formuler une réponse. Ce n'est ben, pas, pas très grave, mais en fait, si je vous pose la question, c'est parce que je regarde le CCA. Oui. Et en fait, tout à l'heure, quand vous avez parlé du CCA, oui. vous avez utilisé la, manière, ben, la, la définition actuelle du CCA, oui. et, euh, qui est un, un exposé de mission qui dit, en gros, le CCA considère que l'architecture a des implications euh, politiques et sociales. Oui. Euh, je ne suis pas sûr que quand le CCA a été créé, euh, Phyllis Lambert l'imaginait comme ça. Et, et du coup, je m'interrogeais sur l'évolution en fait, de, de cette vision de l'actualité de l'archive, et s'il n'y avait pas une, histori une historicité, en fait, euh, et que le rapport au passé était différent, et que précisément, euh, le passé avait peut-être plus d'actualité dans les années 80, mm -hmm. et qu'aujourd'hui, euh, l'usage est devenu plus curatorial, peut-être, mm -hmm. euh, s'il n'y avait pas eu une évolution, en fait, dans, dans ce rapport à l'archive que ben, vous oui, avez repéré en... dans vos travaux Oui, ben, en fait, euh, euh, oui, l'exposition ben, d'architecture dans les débuts du, 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 du CCA, puis, euh, puis comme vous le mentionnez, dans, dans les débuts de, de la Biennale d'architecture de Venise, euh, l'exposition d'architecture était très... Euh, les manières de, de, de la faire étaient très calquées sur, sur le paradigme des beaux-arts, en fait. Il n'y avait pas... Euh, il n'y avait pas l'affirmation propre à l'architecture en tant que pratique spatiale comme on a commencé à l'avoir euh, dans les expositions du CCA euh, au tournant des années, euh, des années 2000. Euh, donc vraiment les artefacts architecturaux, les, 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 les documents, les archives euh, étaient exposés euh, comme des, ob des objets de musée. Euh, comme, comme le sont le son, euh, ouais, le son, les œuvres d'art dans, dans un musée d'art. Euh... Ouais, comme des objets actifs, en fait, oui, comme des de, objets... de, de participer à une discussion et, et d'alimenter en fait, un discours curatorial. Oui, oui, oui comme un véhicule d'un discours euh, actuel et non, et non, et non seulement euh, fait pour témoigner d'une réalité euh, révolue, si je puis dire. Après, la constitution des, des musées dans les années 70, ou des collections, elle supposait que ces artefacts architecturaux, ils avaient vraiment une valeur, donc il fallait les collectionner, il fallait se donner de mo des moyens pour les rassembler. Euh, et, euh, et cette valeur, elle était en partie euh, matérielle, où il y avait une spécificité de ces objets architecturaux. Mm -hmm. Et tout à l'heure, vous, vous parliez euh, du, du, de, de, de manière de réactiver l'archive par l'intermédiaire du, du numérique. Euh, et du coup, je, je, je me demandais euh, dans quelle mesure ce n'était pas une remédiation euh, à stricto sensu que cette euh, publication numérique. The, uh, there's a distinction to be made between uh, uh, what I considered uh, to be a productive archive, like a curatorially productive archive, and an archive, um, so a, a physical uh, artifact. Um, Uh, 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 an architectural drawing or a model or whatever um, that has been um, digitized to to be made accessible to uh, a public. To me, this um, this doesn't um, fit in the same in the same in, in the same uh, in the same state of mind of of, of making uh, an archive productive when it is. Uh, completely recontextualized within a curatorial context. Um, I don't know if it answers uh, the questions correctly, but... There's no answer in particular. I was struck by the current of your work, from the point of view of the historiography. Yes. 
comme vous le rappelez, beaucoup de gens qui s'intéressent à l'exposition et clairement, vous vous positionnez à un endroit où il y a une vraie lacune, en fait, mmh. dans les travaux. Ben, on est en amont de l'exposition, si on veut. C'est davantage, euh, davantage, davantage que ce, qui se passe, euh, ce qui se passe avant, puis en fait, qu'est-ce qu'on qu qu retrouve dans le contenu de, de l'exposition d'architecture. Euh, comme je le mentionnais, la, 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 la deuxième étude de cas... Euh, que j'ai pas commencé, euh, dont, dont j'ai pas commencé euh, l'étude encore, mais, mais ça s'en vient. Euh, à Anvers, en Belgique, euh, c'est le produit en fait d'une fusion de deux institutions, d'une institution euh, euh, muséale en fait qui n'avait pas de collection, qui, qui présentait, qui était destinée à présenter l'architecture uniquement, puis euh, puis d'une archive. Euh, donc clairement, de, depuis la fusion euh, il y a deux ans, euh, on peut observer euh, une présence beaucoup plus, beaucoup plus accrue des archives et d'une certaine façon du passé dans la programmation euh, d'exposition. Euh, alors que euh, ce n'est pas nécessairement un, 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 un ingrédient essentiel à exposer l'architecture. Euh, Leur pratique d'exposition avant était beaucoup plus axée sur le contemporain, puis en fait sur la même sur la, la création d'artefacts expressément pour euh, exposer une pratique euh, d'une agence contemporaine, par exemple, euh, qui n'avait rien à voir vraiment avec le fait de, de réactiver quoi que ce soit hein, du passé. Alors, en fait, vos, vos exemples, à mon avis, sont très bien choisis, justement, parce qu'il y en a un qui est une archive qui devient euh, un centre euh, contemporain mm -hmm. dédié à l'architecture, euh, deux institutions qui se fondent, euh, le MoMA avec l'université. Donc là, on a des dynamiques qui sont super intéressantes à observer. Je m'interrogeais pourquoi vous choisissez d'aborder les, les choses en, en ethnologue, parce que vous êtes architecte. Oui. C'est très intéressant, votre profil, vous êtes muséologue, vous êtes architecte, mm -hmm. vous regardez les pratiques curatoriales avec un regard ethnographique. Oui, euh, je crois que ça me vient de, oui, peut-être du pont... Euh, entre ma formation d'architecte et ma formation de muséologue, en fait, euh, quand, quand, quand j'ai quitté la pratique en architecture pour me diriger aux études supérieures en muséologie, euh, j'ai travaillé, euh, j'ai été confrontée à un fonds d'archives euh, d'un architecte montréalais qui est maintenant décédé, euh, Luc Laporte. Euh, et puis, bon, mon mémoire de maîtrise portait sur euh, ces archives euh, également. Euh, et puis, euh, oui, donc en tant qu'architecte, ou, ou, ou oui, je n'ose même pas dire historienne de, de l'architecture, mais en tant qu'architecte, j'ai été confrontée à cette masse, euh, euh, à cette masse impressionnante de, de, de documents. Donc, par défaut, je dirais, je l'ai peut-être abordé euh, en, en, en ethnologue, ou je l'ai abordé, euh, euh, oui, bien, par l'action, puis par, euh, puis, puis par laisser erreur. Euh, puis c'est un peu, étant donné que c'est un peu le, le, le fil que j'ai suivi, puis le type de méthodologie que j'ai suivi euh, à ce moment-là, euh, ça, ça m'a suivi en muséologie, puis, euh, puis c'est ça que, c'est cette voie-là qui, 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 qui me parlait le plus, en fait, pour l'analyse d'études de cas. Après, euh, je n'ai pas commencé concrètement encore euh, mon terrain, on verra euh, comment ça s'arrime avec... Euh, avec mes, mes ambitions de mobiliser la, la théorie de l'acteur réseau et tout ça. Euh, oui, à suivre. Okay. Merci. <rire> euh, merci à toutes les deux. Et je pense que bientôt, on aura une discussion euh, avec le public pour prolonger en fait, euh, ce premier échange. Oui.